I was told I have to speak into the mic. Wow. My name's Bridget. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Um, so I wrote a lot of notes about what I was going to talk about, so I'm going to kind of read from my notes a little bit and let God give me, hopefully, a message for somebody out there. But for the grace of God and the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've not found it necessary to take a drink or a drug since June 25th, 1988. So for all the people that want the math, I'm 65 years old and I got sober when I was 29. So you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to figure all that out. So um, thank you everybody for being here and thank you for the privilege of being able to stand up here and tell my story. Um, we were raised in a very large family. We have nine children, seven girls and two boys. My father was an alcoholic. He got sober when I was nine years old. Um, we went to Alateen. Um, I think it was even preteen then because we weren't even teenagers and um, learned a lot about the disease of alcoholism and also um, learned about learned the serenity prayer. That's the thing I remember the most. So, you know, my my drinking was was probably normal for most of the people in this room. Um, I started drinking at probably 11 or 12 years old. And um, I can tell you I probably didn't start drinking alcoholically until I was 19 years old. Now, I mean, I drank when I could, but alcoholically, I was sitting in bars at 19. I got married. Um, two years out of high school, and um, I think I got married to get away from my family, from my dad, actually. <laughs> um, he, he was sober a long time, but he had a lot of anger issues, a lot of rage issues. There, were, uh, there was a lot of anger, and um, I've heard people say, we didn't hug in our family, we ducked, you know? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so I met my first husband in my high school, in my senior year of high school. We moved, I had gone to 11 years of school with the same people. My senior year of high school, my parents moved us out of state. So I was new in a school as a senior, um, fell in love with this man, um, and got married, as I said, had a huge wedding, spent all kinds of my parents' money, and blah, blah, blah. And um, that's when I really started bar drinking. Um, after two years of being married to him, I decided I didn't want to be married anymore. I, you know, didn't like it too much. It was, it was interfering with my drinking, so... Um, I moved out on my own, and for four years I lived in an apartment by myself. Well, there were a lot of men that moved in with me at different times, but you know, <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, I liked men, <laughs> still do. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so anyway, and then it, it was just a miracle because. I met this guy who, you know, I, drugs are part of my story. Um, and the thing about drugs for me is that because I did drugs, I escalated to my bottom very quickly. Um, I think if I hadn't started doing drugs, I probably, I could still be drinking today. Who the hell knows? You know, I don't know. But it, it made me hit my bottom pretty quick. So. I met the perfect man. He was a dairy farmer. He had a Harley. He sold cocaine. And he, and he grew pot. 
so you know. Um, it was a dream come true. I was going <laughs> I was going to be barefoot and pregnant on the farm. Well, I can tell you the marriage probably ended during our honeymoon after the cocaine ran out. <laughs> That's about how long it lasted. And uh, no, I was married to him for less than a year. Um, then I, so now I'm 20, 25 years old, good Catholic girl, married, divorced twice. Um, you know, real self-esteem builder there. Um, so then I had this other man that I got in a relationship with that I was, uh, I figured, well, the reason I got divorced twice was because this guy's going to be my dream come true, you know, and he, he was a great guy. He really was. But by this time, my addiction and my alcoholism had taken off. Um, so I, I probably lived with him for maybe three years, and um, he, he joined the Air Force as a judge advocate. He had gone to law school and got his degree, and um, anyway, he, he ended up dumping me, and that, w that was pretty much when I went to my bottom real quick. I started doing more things that I wouldn't have been doing if I wasn't using or drinking or drugging. Um, so at that point, um, I knew I needed help, so I started going to adult children of alcoholics because I knew my parents had ruined my life. I mean, look. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to I wanted to get help for that and find out how I was supposed to fix all that. Um, during my marriages and various relationships I was with in, um, I did go to Al-Anon. Um, so I, now I've been in Al-Anon, I've been in AA, or I've been in Al-Anon, Alateen, Adult Children of Alcoholics. Now I was still using and drinking when I went to ACOA. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so um, I always I went to all kinds of therapists, counselors, marriage counselors, pastoral counselors, everything. And um, during one of these ACOA meetings, somebody told me that they knew this really good ACOA counselor that I should go see that could probably really help me. And um, so I made an appointment and I went and I filled out all the papers that you usually fill out when you go to a new counselor and you list all your sick family members and, you, you know, and that's why I am the way I am because my family's so screwed up. And, um, and then the part came on in the paperwork about how, um, you know, do you drink, do you do drugs, do you do, you know, and I don't know, for some reason, at that point, I got honest, and I started listing all the drugs I did. I started listing the amount of drinking I had done. I would said I'd been in Alateen, Al-Anon, ACOA. I had done all this stuff, and um, so I went in, and she looks at this paper, and she goes, okay, so you were doing drugs yesterday. You've been drinking, you've been to Al-Anon, you've been in Alateen, you've been in adult children. I think you know where you belong. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I did. So I, I really think that was me taking my first step. It was the first time I was honest about what I was doing to my life and not, it was, it was time to stop blaming everybody else. So. Um, so, of course, you know, I had a joint in my car, and I had, I had to smoke that before I could go to an AA meeting. Not, not the same day, but I was like, i got to get rid of this, because <laughs> growing, growing up in my house, a drug is a drug is a drug, and alcohol is a drug. 
So I knew that marijuana maintenance wasn't going to cut it in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so that was probably my biggest fear, giving up my, <laughs> giving up the, the pot. But I did, because I knew. Um, the thing about going to Alateen and ACOA and Al-Anon is that no matter how much I knew, how much knowledge I had of this disease, none of that knowledge stopped me from drinking or drugging. I was an alcoholic and nothing was going to change that. All the book knowledge in the world wasn't going to change that. So, um, I got sober, um, I went into my first meeting, I think on June 25th, and I never looked back. I probably went to meetings every day for two years, at least. I immediately got involved in service work. And that, that, to me, was a pretty integral part of my recovery, my early recovery. And the reason it was is because, one, if I had service work to do, I had to show up at a meeting. I became involved in um, the general service, which is, I won't even go there. But anyway, um, <laughs> There's special people cut out for general service, and there's many people that do it, and you know, but, but I did do it, and I did it for a long time, and it was, I, was able to, uh, I was able to meet a lot of people, and a lot of people with good sobriety. And um, so, let's see. Um, it was probably, two months into my AA, my going to AA meetings on a daily basis before I was finally able to say, my name's Bridget and I'm an alcoholic. And I just bawled my eyes out. And the reason was, is because I was so relieved that there was something wrong with me and that there was a way that I could get myself better. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous was, a way for me to, I don't have to live this way anymore. I don't have to keep marrying all these losers and, uh, you know. So the funny thing is, my dad was, was in recovery about the same, you know, at the same time, and we all went, I lived in the same state where he went to meetings, and he was speaking at this really big speaker meeting. Not this big, but anyway, there were a lot of people. And uh, he said, um, well, before I start, is there um, someone out there by the name of Bridget? And I'm like, and I raised my hand. He goes, would you stand up, please? And I stand up. I thought he was just so proud of me. He goes, that's my daughter. And I thought he was just so proud of me. But what he was saying was, don't go near her. <laughs> <laughs> don't even think about it. And I had no idea until, you know, probably years later. Um, yeah, the thing about growing up in Alcoholics Anonymous and growing up in meetings and everything is that you think that everybody in the room is a really good person. And I know that everybody in the room wanted, wants to be good people, but we don't walk in here winners. We have a lot of baggage. We have a lot of, lot of stuff that went on. I know in my life, I know I had a pretty rough background. And uh, so anyway, um, Sorry, the dog distracted me. <laughs> so, of course, and I just say that to new people because not everybody in AA is, is wonderful. 
I, I mean, we're all great people. We're all sick people trying to get better. That's what I was. But I went in there thinking I could trust everybody because I grew up around people that my dad brought in the house and we could trust them. But that's not necessarily true. So um, it ended up probably within the first three months of my sobriety, I got 13 step by somebody who was from out of town, somebody doing a job from out of town. And um, he didn't hear my dad say, that's my daughter. <laughs> so that, that was a hard lesson to learn. But I, I just say that because there's new people here. And, you know, just make sure you know who you're, who you're hanging out with. And women stick with women and men stick with men. And that, that's really important. Because from my history, I didn't have a real good history with men anyway. So, you know. Um, <laughs> I still love men. I do, but you know, it's it, just not everybody has the right intentions. So, um, so I wanted to just kind of go through um, real quickly. I won't keep you here past eleven. I promise. <laughs> Now, I, I kind of wanted to, I've always heard speakers, I've never spoken in a group this large. I, I've always heard speakers get up and they go through the steps and they say it very eloquently and everything. And I don't know whether I'm hot or cold. It was 90 degrees in Arizona today, so hold on. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, step one, take your jacket off, no. Um, step two, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Um, I did grow up in the church. As you can tell by my marriages, I didn't follow it real well, but, um, but I knew there was a higher power. Um, I learned after being in AA that, that I was insane because I continued to do the same thing over and over again and expected different results, and that's what step two is about. Um, step three, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God, and um, I always loved step three. Um, I had people I would sponsor be like, well, if I turn my life over to God, who am I, you know? And, and I knew, that, so the third step prayer, one of my first sponsors said, third step prayer, seven step prayer every day. So the third step prayer said, relieve me of my bondage of self. And I knew that what I have been doing with my life wasn't working. So that was basically step three for me. And step four, um, the inventory. Um, working with, with sponsees and, and going through this myself, I have learned that it was so overwhelming to think that I had to write down everything in my whole life, like, that's just way too much, I'm sorry, you know, but, but step four just says, make a list, do the, do the columns, and own your part, and the one thing that I have learned about step four is that God isn't going to give me all this stuff that's so bad for me to write down and for me to reveal to myself so much so quickly that I'm going to go drink and drug over it. That all I had to do was, you know, start somewhere, you know. And as I got in different years in sobriety, I did a four-step on relationships. I did a four-step, but you know, to, I just try and 
let people know it's not, you don't have to do everything in the first four step. It's going to be the, the good old onion that we, we, we peel back and that God's going to reveal to me when I'm able to handle it, what I need to look at. And that's how it's worked for me. Step five was confusing because admitted to myself, to God, and to another human being the exact nature of my wrongs. Well, I knew God knew what I had been doing all these years. I knew what I had been doing with all these years. Um, so it was really the only thing about, you know, this other person. But it was, it was the actual doing all those three things together, admitting to myself, to God, and to another human being the exact nature of my wrongs. So, and then six and seven, I always would walk into a meeting, if they said they were on six or seven, I'd be like, oh no. Six and seven, oh, forget it. I felt like I was going into a traditions meeting, you know? <laughs> That was back then. I don't feel that way today. But that's the way I looked at it. It was like, really, six and seven? So six, I just, you know, became willing to have God remove these defects of character. And seven, I've been doing the seven-step prayer all along. So, um, you know, Help me be useful to myself and to others. You know, the seven step prayer. Help me do the right thing. Um, there's no way that I got rid of all my defects of character in the first time I did four, five, six, or seven. <laughs> I still have them today, even. So, um, and eight, when I came in, I thought, I haven't hurt anybody. I've only hurt myself. I didn't, I didn't think about the two ex-husbands I trashed so I could justify leaving them. I didn't think about you know the families I had ruined because when you get married, you marry grandparents, in-laws, aunts, uncles, cousins. You have this whole new group of people. And you walk away and they're all like on what? So, you know, there were a lot of people. So the list, the list for step eight came from, uh, came from my four step. And, and it evolved, just like my four steps evolved. Step nine, um, made direct amends. Um, it took me a while to do that. It wasn't something that I went out and did right away because all of these things was very important for me to have a sponsor to go through this with me, okay? So um, one of my ex-husbands wanted me back. Not happening. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. <laughs> that was Randy. Randy? Yeah. <laughs> they wanted to, my sisters wanted to know which one it was, so anyway. <laughs> My other one, my Harley riding dairy farmer, he didn't want anything to do with me. Um, <laughs> so now we're at step 10, and I can tell you I don't go home every night and get in bed and get out my little list and say, do my little inventory. I don't do that. <laughs> Continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Well, I know when I've done something wrong, my gut tells me something's wrong. Something's eaten my lunch. And that's when I know I need to make, make amends. I need to make direct amends. Um, 11 is another one of my favorite steps because it's seeking through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God as I understand him, praying only for his will for me and the power to carry that out. Um, that has gotten me through um, a lot of things in my sobriety. 
um, 12 carrying the message. Over the years, many different ways I've carried the message by being involved in service, by being in inner group, by sponsoring people, by going to meetings, by taking um, somebody drunk to rehab. Um, and, and I don't know where this got lost. Somewhere, I don't, I don't hear this a lot, but you know, the 12 step calls aren't a lot like they were before, but we were always told to never go on a 12 step call alone. Always have another recovering alcoholic with you. Well, I learned that the hard way. I didn't learn it the hard I, I understand why, because I was taking this woman that we went to her house and another recovering alcoholic was with me and we were driving her to rehab and she literally came over the back seat at me as I was driving down the interstate. So that's why you don't go on 12-step calls alone. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what their family is going to do. You don't, you know, there, there's a reason for that. So, um, my life in sobriety has probably been more tumultuous than when, when I was, than when I was out there running and gunning. Um, three years after I was sober, um, I stayed out of relationships. I lived on my own. I went to AA meetings. I did my service work, and one day I met this man um, through a friend of mine. He wasn't in recovery. My dad was thrilled that he wasn't in recovery because he knew how sick people are in recovery. No, no. <laughs> but no, he was thrilled. But anyway, I ended up marrying this man. So <laughs> I heard a speaker one time say, you know, I would see these red flags, and I'd paint them green and move on. <laughs> you know, and th there were some red flags. This wonderful man, 40 years old, never been married, you know, had a good job, worked really, worked for years at the same company. But he had an alcohol restriction on his license. And you get them if you have too many DUIs. <laughs> but you know what? Hey, he's a nice guy. So anyway, he, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, when uh, we started dating about it, a year after we started dating, we got married in 1993. Um, I had a really good job. I was, you know, successful in my company. Um, he was also a brittle diabetic. Um, had some health issues. Um, as a result of his diabetes and health issues, we weren't able to conceive a child naturally, so in 1996, I did, 1995, I did in vitro, and I had a baby boy in 1996. I had about eight, eight years sobriety then, I guess, and uh, it was probably the happiest day of my life, and, you know, Larry up here talking about his son, um, it was really, it was really touching to me because um, after a few years, we figured out that my son maybe had some mental health issues. He he didn't play well with others. We paid for him to go to this really nice private school, and he got kicked out because he didn't fit in their box. Um, he. By second grade, he no, by second grade he was in full time special ed, and he stayed in special ed until he graduated from high school. 
I don't know, 2005, I don't know, 96, I don't know. Dates, doesn't matter. So, um, a lot, a lot of things happened with my son at six years old. He tried to kill himself on the school bus by strangling himself. Um, took him to soccer, gymnastics, um, Boy Scout, everything I took him to, he got kicked out of. Um, so it, it was very challenging time for me. And um, when he was nine years old, my husband, who, as I said, was a brittle diabetic, had had multiple episodes, probably as a result of his drinking, that um, he would lose, get low blood sugar, he wrecked cars, he had car accidents. We'd go on these wonderful vacations, and everybody thought, Bridget's living the dream. You know, she gets to go and travel, and, you know, didn't know that how many times I had to call an ambulance while I was on vacation because my husband's blood sugar was so low, low he would get he would get violent or just pass out or whatever. I didn't know what to do. So now I'm dealing with my mentally ill son and my husband who in 19, I don't know, 2006, he fell in the bathroom at our house and he broke his leg. He broke his ankle. I had to, this was as a result of low blood sugar. Now. We had had so many incidents of low blood sugar in that house. I mean, I knew the police, they had hung, I knew, I mean, I knew the paramedics, they used to hang the IV bags on my bedpost, and you know, it, it was just nothing for me to call the police or to call the ambulance. Well, then he started getting violent and then the police had to get involved every time I called an ambulance um, because they would, they will, uh, paramedics won't deal with somebody who's violent. They have to have the police there. Um, I remember hiding from my husband with my son in the fire truck out in the driveway because he was out in the woods looking for us, screaming and yelling at us. And uh, so in 90, 2006, he fell in the bathroom um, I couldn't get the door open because he fell and the door was closed and um, he broke his he broke his leg from that point on um, he was in a wheelchair from Memorial Day of 2006 um, by January of 2007 he had had some some major surgery he actually had gone back to work and wrecked another car with my son in it. Um, and he, uh, so in January, he went in for emergency surgery on his leg. I don't know what it was for, what, what happened. It was his, because if you're diabetic, you don't heal, okay? So he um, ended up, having the surgery and the guy came in and said, you know, have you ever had a heart attack? So anyway, by January he had quadruple bypass, open heart surgery. And then by April his leg wouldn't heal and they did a below knee amputation. And so he was in the wheelchair that whole time and then four years later they did below knee amputation on the other leg. So for, um, 12 years, I was a caregiver for my husband. I worked full time. I had a mentally ill son who had friends that came in my house and stole all my jewelry and, you know, did all kinds of nice things. He would, uh, it, it was rough. It was a rough life. And, and I would go to meetings and, and I would talk about what was going on. And, and I don't stand up here to say, oh God, poor Bridget, she had it so rough. 
I stand up here to tell you that Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life because I was able to continue to go to meetings, to have support of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, when, I, when my son was 14, I actually joined a parent support group, so I got outside help because for other parents that had mentally ill children. And um, it, it, you know, I, I don't know, at 16 years sobriety, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, I was commuting 100 miles round trip a day to work. I'd come home from work not knowing what I was gonna find with my son or my husband. Um, So, you know, thinking about doing this talk was pretty difficult for me. I haven't slept in a couple days because I was trying to think of all the things that I had been through, and, and it was a lot. It was a lot. And I never, ever had to pick up a drink or a drug during any of this because I had all you people here for me. I... Um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, my son um, ended up going to jail, and um, I'm not going to talk about why he went to jail. I was like, why well, couldn't it have been drugs and alcohol? That's normal, but no. That's his story. But anyway, he ended up going to jail. And as a result of my parents' support group, I was able to write a letter because they convicted him of the crime and then sent him home for three months. <laughs> what the hell am I supposed to do? I was buying him pot to keep him calm, sober because he was so unmanageable, so angry. So when we went back to court to have him for his sentencing, I sent a huge letter and I said, I've done this since he was four years old. He's been in every program available in Frederick County, Maryland. I've done everything I can do. I do not want my son to come home take him to jail, and that was the hardest letter I ever had to write. And to sit in that courtroom and to listen to him scream when they told him what I had written, you know, um, it, it was really tough. Um, I have a lot of friends, and, and I've seen it in the program where these adult children live at home and they can't get rid of them. I was like, thank God he went to jail. I would not have been able to get rid of him. And, and, and you really, you can't. You can't, you can't. If they've been living there their whole life, you can't just say, oh, take him away. So anyway. It's only 10 of 11, <laughs> so. <laughs> so anyway, I, he went to jail. I continued to work. In 2017, I had my hip replaced. I was home for a long time. My husband's health continued to get worse, and um, instead of going back to work when my hip re finally healed. Um, I, I went in and I retired. Uh, my husband had been in a wheelchair for 12 years. He was done. He said his kidneys were shutting down. He's like, I'm not doing dialysis. And I said, okay. So every time we went to the nephrologist, I'd say, he'd say, well, you can st always change your mind. I'm not doing dialysis. I said, okay. So um, in January of 2018, um, 
his kidneys were dropping. I guess it escalates. The closer, the lower they get, the escalate goes quicker anyway. So he, he started getting really, I knew it wasn't going to be long. So I called in hospice, and he was like, you're just trying to get rid of me. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not. I need help. And I can tell you one thing, when hospice came in, you know, I'm a drug addict and alcoholic. I, I've i never had anybody I had to walk through death with. And here they are, they're gonna bring in these drugs for this, <laughs> for my husband. They're bringing in these drugs. And I said, I want them locked up. I want them locked up. I don't want to have anything to do with those drugs. He didn't need them, and they were taken from my house, and, and he lived seven months. He died on um, July 13, 2018. Um, now I'm living in this big house. My son's out of jail. He knows he can't come home. Now he's married to this woman. So anyway, I'm going to wrap it up because it's getting close to nine. But anyway, he, he, it's after nine. He, um, I sold my house in Maryland. Kelly had a house in Arizona. I went there for Thanksgiving the day, the year my husband passed away. And I was like, I could do this. So a year later, by, by the next summer, I was living in Arizona. I sold my house and, and bought a house in Arizona. And uh, I'll tell you what, I know one thing about my son. If I had not moved across the United States, he would drive to my house to make my life miserable. No, I mean in, in a sick way in a bad way. He'd be at my door screaming and yelling and everything. So anyway, uh, I've tried to have a relationship with him. Um, he blames me for ruining his life and I don't have a relationship with him today. I haven't seen him this Thanksgiving. It'll be two years. I have two granddaughters. One will be, one just turned two in August and one turned, turns four next week. Um, completely estranged from him. It's heartbreaking. It's, um, but I, I have an awesome sponsor in Arizona. I have an awesome tribe of women in Arizona in AA, and they carry me through all this. You know, I, I don't work with my sponsor on not drinking today. I work with my sponsor on grief and how to live today without my son in my life and without being sick to my stomach. I was literally making myself sick. I mean, I know I can make myself sick just worrying about stuff. So anyway, um, I have a great life today. I do. I have a great life today. I look back and, and I look at um, when I was caregiving my husband and, and how angry I would be at him and how resentful I was that I had to take care of him. Um, but I, I, you know, I've forgiven myself for all that. I don't have to live in yesterday anymore. I live in today. Um, from being around the rooms, I mean, I know people that haven't seen their children in years and years and years and years, and they survive. And that, that's how AA works, you know? Somebody else has gone through this, and that's how I am able to say, okay, you did it, and you didn't have to drink or drug. Um, Anyway, I line danced today, hence my little hat, my little cowboy hat I was wearing. I love my line dancing. Um, I volunteer 
Um, I love being retired. I have a great home. I have a great sponsor. Another thing I wanted to talk about with the sponsor, with my sponsor, we meet every, and in all my years of sobriety, I've never done this, but for the past couple years, every week we meet for at least two hours. And it's amazing. One of the benefits of that, and, and I try to tell people who I work with or who I sponsor, that, you know, if, if you don't call me, if you don't tell me what's going on, if I have no idea what's going on in your life, are you guys looking at your watch saying, shut up, Bridget? <laughs> I can do that. Just have a couple more words of wisdom. Okay, I'm good? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm what? Oh, you wanted to hear me. Right, right, right. <laughs> but the thing about being, um, being in contact with my sponsor every week is that she knows what's going on in my life. Like, I have a sponsee who won't call me for weeks. And then she calls, and she's like, oh, God, oh, ah, you know, and you're like, what? <laughs> well, how the hell did you get there? <laughs> Where, if I had heard from her maybe a little more frequently, I might have known what maybe led up to this, blah, you know, and it, it's just crazy. So that's why it's important to stay close to your sponsor, I, you know. I, and the other thing is, have someone else other than your sponsor in your life. Because I can tell you, my life was a little bit crazy. I didn't have a lot of time with what I was dealing with to deal with other people's stuff. So have a tribe, have women, have a group of men, have other people that you can call because we're not always available. We have, we're humans. Just because we're a sponsor doesn't mean that, you know, we have to rescue you or, you know, uh, that's a whole nother story. But anyway, um, <laughs> I really, really appreciate the opportunity to come up here. Um, AA saved my life, and it saves my life today. Um, and uh, thanks for letting me share. I love you all. <laughs>